Galatians 2, verses 1 through 10. Now, before we can attack those verses, we must do what we always do. We must back up, cover what we talked about last week, so that way we are keeping everything in its proper context. So last week, we made our way through Galatians 1, verses 15 through 24. And it's in those verses that Paul is laying out his case to the churches in Galatia. And, and why is he having to lay out his case? Because some Judaizers have come into the churches in Galatia. And, and do you know what they're claiming? That Paul isn't a true apostle. That, that, that Paul was actually a, an apostle because of men. Men made him an apostle and not Christ. But the Judaizers are also doing something else. They're, they're coming in behind Paul, and, and they're changing the gospel. But what they're telling the churches in Galatia is that you first must become a Jew before you can become a Christian. So what are the Judaizers wanting to do? They're wanting to take the church backwards. They're, they're wanting to place them underneath the civil and the ceremonial laws. Well, Christ fulfilled those laws. So Paul is making sure that, that the churches in Galatia are hearing this truth from them by way of this letter. And you know what he's pretty much saying? That these Judaizers that have snuck in, they're from Satan. This is just a bold-faced lie. Now, now understand what Paul is doing here. He is defending the faith. And this may shock some of us. That, that Paul's not coming across as this Mr. Nice Christian guy who just lets people run all over him. Listen, there has to be a time where every Christian stands for the truth. And you know what? You're not going to be liked for it. This is, this is what Paul is doing. The Judaizers are wrong. They are liars. They are from Satan. And I'm going to prove this to you. So, so it's here that Paul, in this letter, is pretty much laying out his own biography. And he's telling the church that no man has influenced him to become a Christian. That, that he's never sat underneath the apostles, nor did they lay their hands upon him and make him one. Well, what Paul is saying is that the same ways in which those apostles which they became apostles is the same way in which Paul became an apostle through the revelation of Christ. Christ himself revealed himself to Paul, making him an apostle. There was no three years of seminary for Paul sitting underneath the apostles. Now, if you recall what took place on the road to Damascus when Paul, who was Saul then, was a Pharisee, was going after Christians. He was going to persecute the Christians. But on that day, Christ knocked Paul off his horse. And through that revelation, everything changed. Paul left his livelihood. Paul left his family. Paul lost his friends over this. But Paul had to stand for the truth. So, so what took place after God knocked Paul off his horse that day? Well, we know that Paul, for three years, goes away. He goes into the land of Arabia. And, and what did he do there? I'll be honest with you. We, we don't know. But he spent time in Arabia and then he returns back to Damascus. And what does he do in Damascus? He begins preaching and teaching the word. The, the very word that he was going to persecute Christians for believing. It was a radical change that didn't come by way of man. Now something that we do know is that there were no apostles in, in Arabia, nor were there apostles in Damascus during that three year period. And that's what Paul is telling the church. I didn't learn from man. It was from Christ. It was a work of God. Now we know that after those three years, what happens? 
after those three years of Paul teaching the gospel, he finally goes to Jerusalem. And what, what's he do there? He visits with Peter and James. Now, this is the first time he's been around any apostles since his conversion. Three years. Teaching, preaching. Now, he meets the apostles, or two of them. And how long was, how long was Paul there? Fifteen days. What can you learn in 15 days? Not a whole lot. So Paul is saying, yes, I did meet with the apostles, but this was three years after I was preaching. It was a short amount of time. Why only 15 days? <laughs> well, the Jews wanted to kill Paul. Why? Because he's preaching and teaching the word. So Paul has to flee. He has to get out of Dodge or Jer Jerusalem, I should say. So he leaves there and he goes to Syria and Cilicia. And guess what he's doing there? He's preaching the word to the Gentiles, not the Jews. And remember, there was a conflict between the Jews and Gentiles. that They didn't like one another. But Paul, through this revelation of God, he knows that he has been sent to the uncircumcised. So this is the spreading of the word. So here Paul is preaching to the Gentiles. And, and the Christian council in Judea, they, they hear about this. They hear about this great revelation, this, this not revelation, that's the wrong word, um, revival. That's what I'm thinking of, yes. Way to do that in the middle, Britt, great. Have an argument with yourself. The revival, but there's this great revival that's taking place among the Gentiles. So, so the council in Judea, this Christian council, they hear about this. And they're like, Barnabas, we've got to figure out what's going on here. I mean, we hear what, what Paul is preaching and teaching, and, and it lines up with exactly what we're saying, but let's go down and find out more. And that's what happens. So Barnabas hooks up with Paul, and, and what happens, they go on their first mission trip together, and they're planting churches all over. So this is why Paul is saying all this to the church in Galatia, because of the false teachers, the Judaizers, that have come in. And they're saying that you can't believe Paul because he's not like the true apostles. They're also saying that, you know, for, for him to be, for you all to be true Christians, you must be circumcised. You must first become a Jew. And Paul's like, no. You cannot distort the word of God. You cannot take it and you cannot twist it. Paul's upset. And, and he's making sure that these false teachers are called out. Not only called out, but the council that he's going to speak in front of, he's going to make sure that they call them out. So it's not just coming from him. That's what he is doing here. Again, this is something that we in the West, especially the Christians in the West, I should say, we've become too nice. When it comes to false teachers, that is. Guys, we have, we have got to take a stand. We, we see it all throughout the scripture, but for some odd reason, I don't, I don't know why the, the church in the West, we tend to avoid this. We, we want to come across more like a Mr. Rogers or Ned Flanders. But that's the reason why we're in the shape that we're in today. This is the reason why so many false teachers have made their way into the church. Because we're not taking a stand for the truth. We should get upset. There's, there's a thing called righteous anger. And if anyone's going to mess with the word of God, that should bother us. And you know what? We take it a step further and we say something about it. Okay. Okay. Galatians 2, verses 1 through 10. Paul accepted by the apostles. Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. When it comes to Paul, him taking Titus is such a smooth move. Paul, in, in this realm, is actually playing 4D chess when it comes to the Judaizers. And we're going to get to that here in a second. So, from the time that 
Christ has revealed himself to Paul, it has been 17 years. So three years of him doing something in Arabia and then coming to Damascus and preaching and teaching. And, and then you add the 14 years. So 14 years later, he finally returns back to Jerusalem. Now, this is probably the third time in 17 years that Paul has been to Jerusalem. The first time was the one I just discussed when he went up there and met with um, Peter and James for 15 days. And remember, he had to leave because the, the Jews wanted to kill him. And, and then there was a, another time in which him and Barnabas took supplies to the churches in Jerusalem. And, and Paul doesn't really mention that in this because it was so quick. It was more like a drop-off and then we go. There probably wasn't any meetings that took place. It, it was, here's the supplies that you all need. We're out of here. And, and then we have this, the third time. Fourteen years later, from the first time, he met with Peter and James. But this time he was going to stand before the council in Jerusalem. And why? Because of this issue that was taking place in Galatia. He, he's wanting to stop this. He's wanting to crush these false teachers. And these false teachers, what were they doing? Why did it upset Paul so much? Because they were adding to the word of God. You must first become a Jew, and you must also follow the oral laws of man that the Jews have added to the scripture. Paul wasn't going to stand for this. There's no reason why man should add to the scripture. You know what that's saying? The word isn't good enough. Something else needs to be added. Which is why we need to say this too. We have the complete inerrant and infallible word of God from from Genesis to Revelation it, it is done it is complete something that we should all struggle with today is if you have someone come up behind the pulpit or, or an author writing a book talking about a vision that God has given him or her what are you saying is the word not enough you you have to add to it now not only that I mean I've got a question where this vision came from Again, did you eat some bad pizza the night before? I don't know what drugs you did in high school. There's this thing called flashbacks that take place. Could have been something there. We just don't know. What we have is the Word of God. We do not need to add to it. Nor do we take from it. But that's what the Judaizers was doing. They were going in behind Paul to wreck the gospel. Now, why did Barnabas, why is Barnabas with Paul? Well, Barnabas helped Paul plant those churches in that region. And then we have Titus. Why is Titus with Paul? Well, well Titus is a believer who's assisting Paul in his ministry. But, but Titus is a Gentile. He hasn't been cut and so what the Judaizers were teaching in this realm is that for Titus to be a true believer, he has to be circumcised. So Paul's like, we're bringing Titus with us. We're going to bring this up before the council. And we're going to settle this once and for all. Again, Paul is playing 40 chess with the Judaizers. He's a brilliant man. This was a, a, a cunning move in a way. So we look at verse 2. Before I say this, we know that there was an issue that, that, was, that was taking place with Paul, and of course that's his title of apostle. The Judaizers were calling him out on that as well, that, that it came from man and not from Christ. So, so Paul is going to get this cleared up as well. But Paul didn't really want to go before the council in a way. He was struggling with that. So, so what happens? Well, it tells us in verse 2, I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential. So, so the Holy Spirit eased the mind of Paul. Whatever reason he was struggling with, 
to go before the council, the Holy Spirit comes to him, and it's like, you're going. You're going. This is what has to be done. So that puts Paul at ease. So here he goes to stand before the council. But before he meets with the entire council, he meets with those privately who seemed influential. And then this was probably Peter, John, and Jesus' brother James. There may have been some other apostles involved there. But why did he do it privately? Well, one of the things that Paul was going to make sure of is that they were on the same page. So Paul had to lay out what all was taking place in those churches in the land of Galatia and how it is that he was planting those. But not only that, he was also telling them about the signs and wonders, the miracles that were happening. And then his preaching and teaching and the Gentiles coming to believe. And this was lining up perfectly with what they too had experienced. Let me touch on this just real quick. See, this is one of the reasons why we don't make it all the way through the verses. Forgive me. But one of the other things that, that we have to understand today when it comes to the signs and wonders that were taking place during the, the, uh, the apostolic ages was because we didn't have the entire word of God. It wasn't completed. So, so here these apostles were receiving direct revelation by God through the Holy Spirit. But not only were they able to do that, they were also producing signs and wonders to back up what was coming out of their mouth. This is the reason why we hold that the apostolic sign gifts and wonders have ceased today is because the Bible, the word is complete. Now, a lot of people, this kind of, this kind of freaks some people out because they're, they're sitting here saying, it's like, well, are you saying that God can't do miracles today? No, 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 it's not what we're saying at all. We're saying that absolutely God can do miracles today. He can do whatever he wants. Whatever he wills is going to be done. What we're saying is there's not apostles walking around today Raising the dead or healing someone with cancer by laying their hands upon them. God can do that. But this was a sign gift that was given to the apostles to prove to the people that were hearing them that this was from God. And you can, you can imagine when, when, when Paul preached so long and that kid fell out the window and it killed him. And then, and then Paul walks out there, lays his hand upon him, the kid gets back up. And the people are like, well, there's some truth here. Kid was dead, and now he's up talking. All right, we believe you. But we have the inerrant and infallible word of God today. So there are no more apostles. And if there are no more apostles, because they laid the foundation, that's what we've learned. And now the foundation has been laid, the church has been established. No more apostles. We, we, we have the word of God. So, so here, Peter and Barnabas and Titus are, are sitting in there with the influential ones, and they're having this discussion. He's going back and forth with them. And I think something else may be going on here with Paul. He's wanting to make sure that these men aren't going to sell him out to the Judaizers. You know, he comes all the way out here. He's laying out his case. And, and to imagine that these three or four or five apostles would look at him and say, well, you know, we, we understand that this revelation came directly from God, but we are kind of siding on the Judaizers with this whole, let's bring you back into the Jewish faith. Of course, that's not what happens, but Paul wasn't going to waste his time if they weren't all on the same page. So there he is. They're having this private meeting, and, and then continuing in the verse, he says, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Okay, so, so again, still in the private meeting, and, and Paul's just going to lay out. He's like, this is what I've been teaching. This is what the gospel is that I am proclaiming. And you know what that is? Whether they be Jew or Gentile, this is what is taught. You are a fallen creature from birth, a sinner from birth. You exit the womb, and you're as mean as all get out. Not as mean as you want to be, because even God's grace and mercy restrains your meanness. And we've said this time and time again. This is why babies, when they exit the womb, they can't walk because they'd probably murder you in the middle of the night because they're so hungry. They're, they're not born with teeth either. Why? Because they're mean, selfish little things. Once that first tooth comes in, it becomes a weapon. They're not innocent, all right? And neither are we. That's who we are from birth. Wicked creatures. And you know what? From birth, we do not want God. We are sinners who have rebelled against His commands. 
And what does God deserve? What does he command? Perfection. Because every single sin that we commit, I don't care if it's a little white lie, whatever it may be, it is a sin against the Holy One who created you. And you don't want God. You're not even seeking after God. Go to Romans, it says that. So what is it that God does for you, the wicked? Before the foundation of the world, this was his plan. He knew exactly what was going to take place in the garden. From that very sin, that is where we come from. From the first Adam. Fallen man. So what does God do before the foundation of the world? He has laid this out that the second Adam is going to come. The perfect Adam. Now the sin of the first Adam took place where? At the tree. But when it comes to the second Adam, our atonement, where does it take place? At a tree, the cross. So Christ being the second Adam, the perfect one who fulfilled the law because we couldn't. He took the believer's sins upon himself. God's wrath was poured out upon him. The very wrath that every single one of us in here deserve. Why? Because of our rebellion against God, our sins against God. But you know what Christ did? He received the believer's sins upon himself that day on the cross. Your sins, if you are a believer in here today, they were imputed to Christ. But the imputation doesn't stop, stop there. Do you know what Christ did for you? He imputed his righteousness to you. It is a beautiful story. It is heartbreaking, but it is beautiful at the same time that the perfect one was put to death because of us, the wicked. But from that point on, when your faith is in Christ, every single sin has been wiped away. Please hear me when I say this, because I know there are some of you in here that just struggle with this one sin in your life, and you may not struggle with it anymore. What I mean by that is you can't let go of it. There is something that you have committed in the past, and, and every single day it is eating up, it's just eating you up alive inside. Listen to me. If your faith is in Christ, that sin has been paid for in full. It's difficult, I understand, but you can let it go. It's in the past. Christ's blood washed it away. See, this is what Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. This was what he is telling the influential ones behind closed doors. And what do these, what do these men do? Do they hear this? Do they walk up to Paul and lay their hands upon him and say, okay, we're going to ordain you to, to become an apostle now? Nope. Do they, do they come up to him and say, okay, we're going to ordain for you to now go out and become a preacher to the Gentiles, the uncircumcised? No. They just agree with him. And they understand that the only reason why Paul is a believer, the only reason why Paul is an apostle is because of Christ. So continuing in this verse, again, still in this private meeting, he says, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. See, this is the part where we see that the reason why Paul is meeting with him privately is he's wanting to make sure, hey, look, I've come this way. This is the gospel that, that, that I've been preaching and teaching. This is what has been revealed to me, the Christ himself. If we're not on the same page, then I've done all this in vain. Paul's blunt. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, I, I think that's beautiful. I, I think it's quite okay for us to be blunt with one another when it comes to the word. And that's what Paul was telling the influential ones there, the other apostles Guys, if we're not on the same page, then I, I've wasted my time here. Now look at verse 3. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Okay. Th this is the 4D chess part, right? 
And, and this is going to be part of the letter that's sent back to the churches in Galatia. So here, Titus is meeting with the influential ones. Paul has laid everything out before them. Barnabas is sitting right there, shaking his head, agreeing. Now you would think that if what the Judaizers were preaching and teaching in Galatia, that for one to become a true believer, they must be cut, they must be circumcised, you would think they would say, okay, we have Titus right here. Now, Titus, I know you're a Greek, and, and that means that you haven't been cut you're, you're going to have to do that before you leave. Yeah. Go get the knife. Mm. But that's not what happened, was it? No. Not at all. They didn't say, go get the knife. They say, welcome, brother. Did you understand that, that Paul is wanting to put a beat down on the Judaizers, and he's doing this by way of this meeting, because they are in full agreement. He's wanting to crush this nonsense that is flowing through the churches in Galatia. Man, we can learn something from this. Could you imagine what could be done today if we as believers had that same type of zeal as, as Paul? I mean, do you think that Stephen Furtick would still have a church in North Carolina? Or, or Joel Osteen? Do, do you think that, that Beth Moore would still be preaching and teaching if we responded in the same way of Paul? No. So, so here, with, with Titus being there, this letter that's going to be sent back is going to prove that what the Judaizers are saying is false, that salvation is not a works-based salvation. It, it doesn't depend on how closely you fall, to follow the, the Jewish civil laws or their ceremonial laws. That's not what it's about. Christ fulfilled those things. As a matter of fact, the civil and ceremonial laws, what were they doing? They were pointing to Christ, to the perfect one who was to come. Same with the moral laws. This is where the difference lies between the civil and ceremonial laws, because there's three laws. And then the moral laws. The moral laws, think of the Ten Commandments, right? The, the Ten Commandments weren't abolished. They, they were fulfilled by Christ. Here's something that takes place as a believer. You know what you now want to do when it comes to the Ten Commandments? You want to follow them. Reason why? To please the one who saved you. Is that going to get you into heaven? No. But your heart's been changed. You've been regenerated. You want to please the Father now, not run from Him. Okay, now look at, look at verse 4. So Titus is in the clear. He doesn't have to be cut. It, it, the, the count, the, the small group of men, the apostles, are like, there's no way what the Judaizers are teaching and preaching is true. And we see this in verse 4. Yet... Because of false brothers. Man. Again, Paul's not holding any punches. He, he didn't sit back and say, well, you know, I'm going to give them some grace. Maybe they just don't completely understand what it is that they're saying. Maybe they're just confused. No. Paul's saying, listen. Once you start tweaking the word, once you start messing with the word of God, once you start adding to it or taking away from it, you know what you are? You are a false brother if that is what you're teaching. I mean, I've told you guys that John the Baptist has always been one of my favorites, and I don't know if you should have favorites, but Paul's closing in on him. He just doesn't, he just doesn't hold back. He wants to stop this nonsense. So he's calling them false brothers because they have created a false word. He even says, secretly brought in. They know exactly what they are doing. And you know what this is? It's not godly. So if it's not godly, it only falls into the other category, that being it's satanic. It is against God. 
Now, there were some Judaizers, these false brothers, who actually believed in this false satanic teaching. And that's why they're bringing it into the church to destroy the gospel. But what's also sick is that you had some Pharisees who were pretending to be Judaizers coming into the churches in Galatia to try and destroy it. Why? They didn't want any more Jews converting over to Christianity. So they're going to try and stop it wherever they can, even if that means them going into the Gentile land to make sure this isn't taking place. And that's what a false teacher is. He is a he works for Satan. False teachers are there to do one thing and one thing only to destroy the good news. Just let that sink in for a moment. And now do you understand why Paul is so angry? While he wants to stop this wickedness? Paul gets this. Paul, Paul's sitting there and he, he's like, Christ, who revealed himself to me, but this is the same Christ who died on the cross because of my sins. And, and you're wanting to twist those words? Not under my watch. It's crazy, isn't it? We, we can get upset when someone says something against our favorite college football team. I mean, raging mad. But, but when someone presents a false gospel, we, we, we're kind of like timid. So we go from a pit bull to a cat. I shouldn't say a cat. That's Satan's creature. Um, I'm kidding. I know there's cat people in here. You need, you need to get a heavenly dog. <laughs> it's true. But anyway, so, so this, is what, this is what is taking place, and Paul is trying to stop it. And even continuing in this verse, he says, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. I mean, this just kind of gives us a new understanding of what it means to be a false teacher and what it is that they are trying to do. I mean, because of what Christ did in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, do you know what Christ did in all of those things? He freed man from the ceremonial laws and the civil laws of Judaism. And again, he also freed them from the moral laws because it's not the moral laws that are going to get you into heaven. It never, that was never going to happen because you cannot be perfect. So Christ fulfilled those. But what the Judaizers are wanting to do, what they're wanting, their plan is, is to add to this good news, to bring you back underneath the civil and the ceremonial laws. And they're going to tell you if you do not complete them perfectly or as close to perfect as you can, you may not be getting into heaven. Christ frees you from that bondage. Any type of religion that makes it a work-based based salvation, brings you back into bondage. It makes you a slave. And that's what the false teachers are trying to do. Put them back in chains. Because of the Jews and the Judaizers, their, their faith was based upon their self-righteous works. And that doesn't save. There's only one who saves, and that is Christ and Him alone. This is upsetting to Paul. Let's look at Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You have been set free by what Christ has done. And Paul is saying, I'm not going to allow these false teachers to come back in the churches in Galatia 
and tell you something otherwise. It's wicked and it's corrupt. Well, we got through four verses, didn't we? Let me, let me add to this, because I understand that this is taking place in, in the time of Paul, and he's dealing with these false teachers coming in and adding to the gospel. And, and you may be thinking, well, good for Paul and what, what he did during that time. You know, I, we see the example that's being set. I'm not really sure how this applies to us today. Well, I can tell you this still applies to us today because Satan has made his way back into the church using false teachers once again. But he's not just infiltrated the church, he's also infiltrated the seminaries. And, and sadly, he's made his way into reformed seminaries. And he's done it through critical race theory. And it's wicked. That that's how he has entered into the church and the seminaries once again. It's through this theory. Where does our faith lie? In Christ alone and what he accomplished. But now what we're being told is there are certain sins from a particular point in time in history that we still need to repent of. That we don't treat each other when it comes to our faith by who our faith is in, but also by the color of our skin. Which is absolutely insane. I mean, I would love for this church to be red, yellow, black, and white. I really would be. I think it would be beautiful. But I also understand where we live. We live in Saudi Daisy, where it's a bunch of white folk here. But, but I would. I, I would love for every color to be in this place. And how would we treat every single color? The way we treat each other. As brothers and sisters in Christ. Because that's who we are. But through critical race theory, we're being taught inside the church, inside seminaries, that we treat each other differently by the color of our skin because of our experiences. And this is absolutely insane. Seminaries have bought into it and pastors have bought into it. I, I need to talk with the elders, so forgive me for just bringing this up right now. Um, th there is a, a, a documentary that has recently came out called Enemies Within the Church. And it's long, it's about two hours and 15 minutes. But it's laying out exactly how the gospel has been distorted by this wickedness. If, if anybody in here is interested in, in seeing this documentary, which I would encourage every single one of you to watch it, um, please grab one, myself or, or one of the elders, and I need to talk to the elders, like I said, but there's a way in which, as a church, we can come together and we can get this code and you can digitally download it and watch it at your house. Or, something even crazier, I know, brace yourself. You know, maybe we have a movie night here with enemies within the church. But it's something that, guys, we, we have to be vigilant when it comes to what's being taught inside the seminaries and inside the church. There's a reason why Paul in Ephesians talks about the armor of God because it is a battle that is going to continue until he returns. We have to hold to the word. We have to get upset when someone twists it. And we have to stand for it. Stand for the truth, that is. Okay, I would love for you guys to come back next week and we'll finish verses 5 through 10. Hopefully. All right, let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this understanding. And, and we thank you for, even before the, the world was formed, 
you knew the Apostle Paul. You created the Apostle Paul for that very moment in time. You revealed the truth to him. And he fought for the truth. He died for the truth. And Lord, that that wasn't him. That was the Holy Spirit dwelling within him. that, That made him this new person who was going to fight till his death to protect the word. Lord, I I pray that by way of the Holy Spirit, every single believer in here has the desire to do the same thing, to fight for the truth, to stand for the truth, no matter what the cost may be. Because, we, Lord, we know that our time here It's the blink of an eye. But our time with you and our brothers and sisters in Christ is going to be eternal. Let us remember that when we are standing for the truth. Can we say all these things in your son's holy name? Amen.